Jurisdiction is a very interesting subject in the United States because of the way the United States began. We start we start off as colonies, and then later we became independent little countries. Uh, later we became states, but even when we became states, we reserved a lot of rights for each individual state as a political and governmental unity a unit. So for that reason, our, our laws concerning what law applies in any one state varies from one state to the next. I can have a uh, interaction in Texas and just a few miles from here in Oklahoma, the court system is different and the laws are some different. Because of that, it's an interesting study for people in other countries dealing with the United States because New York, in a way, in the same position as people within the states in the United States. Uh, let me start uh, closer to the beginning. First of all, go to my webpage if you get a chance because my paper and many of the authorities I'm going to quote to you appear uh, on my webpage, which is www.bailey-law.com. I'm a, a board-certified personal injury trial lawyer in Texas. And for many years, we've done trial work and appellate work here. So this is my area of interest. The uh, division of the court system today in the United States is even more complicated than you might imagine because we have each state with its own set of legislatures and court system and laws that come from that but we also have laying over that a federal court system. So in Texas, as an example, uh, if I have a question of federal law, let's say constitutional law, uh, then I would go to the federal court to have that heard. But at the same time, if I have a local uh, law issue, if there's diversity of the party, parties, in other words, the defendants are in one state and I'm in another, the federal court will hear those as well. In 1938, in a case called Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, the question came up, well, if you have a diversity case, so you're in federal court, are you following the law of the federal courts or are you following the law of that state? You have law that comes from either uh, legislation, uh, which comes from the Congress or the legislature, and then you have call, uh, law that's created by uh, the court of decisions called common law. So the question is, if you're in federal court, do you have your own set of federal common law dealing with, say, a car wreck? And in Erie versus Tompkins, they said, no, you don't. The federal court applies federal law if that is uh, uh, a, a statute, but if it's just common law, if it's just decisions made by the courts, they must follow the law of that state. So we try to make things as complicated as we possibly can in the United States. And this is one way we've done it. One example of that is uh, Gasparini, uh, uh, in the United States Supreme Court in 1996 in which there was a state law dealing with restrictions on trial by jury. Trial by jury is a very, very important civil right in the United States because we try to take those decisions away from the government and give it to the people. In this particular case, the state courts limited the manner in which jury, jury or trials could be done. And the question then was, since we have a specific constitutional provision that allows right to trial by jury, can that be restricted by the states? And the courts held that it could be. So we had this continual tension between the state and the, uh, and the federal laws as they apply to each of us in different cases. Now, some of the things that have happened literally since I started law school uh, 
a little over 40 years ago, such as the uh, Uniform Commercial Code. Before that, each state had their own business laws. So you could be in, involved in a contract with someone in North Dakota and someone in New York, and each of them would have different laws that apply to the business transactions. We finally remedied that uh, with the Uniform Commercial Code that's been adopted by all of the states. But before that, we had the nightmare of trying to figure out what law applies to just a common everyday business transaction. Uh, you can imagine the judicial administration of these rules uh, has evolved quickly after that. Can you imagine, for instance, the United States uh, on other issues of dealing with uh, what law should apply? For instance, if I bought a car tomorrow, oh, it was built in Detroit. Oh, really? Well, how about uh, the parts that were manufactured in France and the uh, component parts in uh, Taiwan? And uh, the uh, pieces that uh, uh, had been uh, gone, had been gone through a marketing process in Russia, all of those end up in the same vehicle. So what law applies if you are mad about the fact that your car uh, ran off the road because of a failure of, the, of a piece that was made in uh, Holland? So you have these issues that once were just state issues in the United States, now are literally worldwide, and it's going to be more so every day. And one of the things that each of you as attorneys uh, will need to consider and, and provide uh, the necessary advice to your clients about starts at the very, very beginning. What does your contract look like? Is there a form selection clause within your contract? If not, get one. Figure out where you want these things to be heard, what law you want to have applied, and what court you want to have hearing. If you don't do that, you have given up your first most important uh, uh, rule of uh, taking care of the, your client and the advantage that you can have in different court systems. There's limitations to that. For instance, let's say you uh, have a website and you're advertising and selling things on the website. Can you put in a form selection within that website? Eventually, the courts are going to say it's too far removed from an interaction between two people. You have a, co a consumer who doesn't have a lawyer who's trying to buy a small item, and yet the company you represent in Russia, as an example, has you to make a decision. The, the parity is too far apart. And the re remedy, if you uh, choose a, a forum outside of, of a reasonable forum for the consumer, would be too great. So there's limitations, but certainly that's the first thing to address. Do I need to have a, a, a decent forum for the, the, the determining disputes? And secondly, where is that? And how do I get it into a contract? Well, let's go past the, the form selection uh, provision and start talking about the litigation itself. Uh, Pre-trial discovery uh, might include interaction uh, with parties uh, through the internet to test the presence of that particular uh, company or person in a particular forum. Corporations, you know, don't exist. They're just a legal fiction. We made them up one day. So how do they have a presence anywhere so that you can figure out what forum that they belong to? It's through their activities. Uh, the court has the right over parties that have a presence within their forum. So how does uh, General Motors have a presence in the forum? They do it by uh, the activities they have within that uh, area. Uh, so that's true with the Russian corporations as well. If you want uh, your uh, Russian corporation that you represent not to have exposure to a United States jurisdiction, then you need to be very careful about what kind of presence they have. There's two kinds of presence. There's specific, that's where you have activities dealing with the issue at law uh, uh, that's before the court, and there's general presence. That's where you just have a presence in the forum, but it doesn't have anything to do with a particular issue before the court. 
there's a different standard for those. You have more general uh, rules that apply to specific jurisdiction if you're actually involved in something dealing with the issues before the court, and a, a, a stricter uh, rule if it just general jurisdiction, general presence that you might have, though it doesn't have anything to do with the case. Uh, these decisions have been made in the United States and they're all over the board. Uh, so almost any position you can take, I can find you a case that will go along with that. And I think you'll see that in some of the op opinions that I've posted on my website. In addition to the forum, there's also a thing called choice of laws. So it's conceivable that you could file a lawsuit in California and yet convince, uh, the defendants could convince the, uh, the court, well, yes, California has jurisdiction over the parties, but really, to be fair, we need to apply the law of, of uh, South Dakota because that's where all of the relevant activities took place. So not only you have the issue of finding a forum where the court says, we're going to hear this case here, you also have a secondary argument, and that is, uh, yes, okay, you can hear it in this court, but you really need to apply the law of another state because of this, uh, the facts surrounding the case. Uh, I, mean, I gave this lecture the other day uh, in New York, in my in my pocket was my my cell phone, and all of my calls in my office are automatically sent to me in writing and verbally. I can sign up a client right after my my uh, presentation in New York. Well, do I have a presence in New York? Uh, do they have a a forum in New York that should hear my ca uh, a case against me if uh, if they wish? Uh, possibly so. Uh, I've uh, I've been in Russia uh, uh, giving uh, lectures, and while there, have got emails and entered into agreements with other uh, attorneys dealing with legal issues of a case that I'm trying. Well, do I have a presence in Russia? Uh, can Russian of uh, course then hear uh, something dealing with me because I have a presence in that forum? It's only going to get wilder. Think about it. How many of you have uh, Skype that you use all the time? Uh, what are the uh, what are the different ways you communicate on your iPhone now? Certainly not just by phone, but uh, uh, all the other methods that people uh, uh, contact each other today is only to get wilder. So you have literally an international presence if you have an iPhone. So how are these going to play out, and how will they affect you and your, your clients in Russia? If you play your cards right, they can be helpful to you both directions. You can argue that you do not have a presence that allows an American court to hear something dealing with your client, or you may look into it and see that the law is much better for you in the United States. Uh, so you may want to work that into your contract as a form selection. You may want to argue to the court, yes, I know uh, that uh, these are Russian citizens involved in this, but look how much presence the defendant has in the United States. This is a matter we would like to have heard there. And that happens uh, from time to time. So it's a sophisticated, interesting part of the practice, practice of law in litigation. And it only is going to become more relevant every day as our, as our technology continues to increase. Uh, I was retained uh, uh, not too long ago by an engineer in Bangladesh because he had uh, he was a victim of a uh, a disease that was created at his workplace. He found me through the internet, so you can see that these are issues that are not just hypothetical but exist all the time. Uh, I I tease my uh, American friends when I give these lectures that really it's better to have a a group of English majors to be uh, listening to or uh, reading these cases to decide what the law is because the semantics uh, in, the, in the opinions is so bizarre and so uh, different and so vague that you can make all sorts of conclusions from it. 
Let's start back uh, with International Shoe versus, in, versus Washington. That's a 1945 United States Supreme Court opinion. Now, International Shoe, uh, ending right, published right after the end of World War II, uh, we have an opinion dealing with jurisdiction that is quoted today. You're not going to pick up an opinion today uh, dealing with forum selection that does not mention International Shoe. Now, in this case, they were trying to uh, recover pay payments due to unemployment compensation fund in Washington State. The uh, company, International Shoe, had no office in Washington State, entered into no contracts in Washington State, had no stock of uh, mer merchandise in the state. Uh, there were no intrastate deliveries. Uh, authorities of the salesmen were limited to showing samples and taking orders. But the court found, quote, continuous and systemic uh, presence giving rise to jurisdiction because the defendant purposely availed itself of the benefits and privileges of doing business in the forum state. So that's the thing that you're going to see quoted a lot in these cases. And you can see how that could apply not only to American citizens, but to citizens throughout the world. I recommend that you use the specific language of that case because uh, language is almost everything when you start looking at all these opinions and how they distinguish one from the other with just a word, the one word or another. Continuous and systemic uh, uh, presence, that's what they talk about. The next case you'll see in the brief, if somebody gives you one dealing with uh, jurisdiction, is Zippo Manufacturing. Uh, it's a 1997 case. It's a, actually, it's a uh, case out of uh, Pennsylvania, and it's uh, from a district court. In federal courts, you have the district courts, and then the appellate courts, and then the United States Supreme Court. Most of the time, the district courts merely listen to uh, cases and try lawsuits. But sometimes they publish opinions. It's called uh, F sub or Federal Supplemental uh, Opinions, and the Pennsylvania District Court did that in 1997. It's quoted more than any of the district court cases. An in international shoe that adopted uh, a test dealing with the web, and they call it the, the sliding scale test. Uh, and basically what you have is a decision uh, concerning specific jurisdiction. Remember I told you specific is when you have presence that deals with the facts of the case. Uh, but it's also been used uh, in cases, quoted in cases where they're considering general jurisdiction, where the, where the presence has nothing to do with the case before the court, but just generally the party has a presence in the jurisdiction. In Zippo, contracts were made almost exclusively over the internet the company had no offices, employees, or agents present in the forum. Advertising was done through the internet. The court set out a sliding scale test. On the one hand, you had a scale uh, finding that the company clearly does business over the internet in the jurisdiction uh, and ter territory of the court, uh, such as transferring of files, contracts with residents, and so forth. In the middle, you had a, a varying degrees of interaction, and at the other end, you have only an internet presence, but not any specific uh, activity within the forum. And so the court says, find where you are on that sliding scale, then make a qualitative decision on whether or not the court should have jurisdiction over the parties. Now, ironically, you know, this was a avant-garde case at the time because he was talking about presence through the internet, through the web. But look at what we have now. I mean, we've got uh, uh, Facebook, we've got Twitter, we've got LinkedIn. When you think about it, uh, this is almost archaic compared to what you guys do today. If I got through the, the purses and the billfolds that you guys have right now, I guarantee you there's a presence in all sorts of electronic kind of devices in all sorts of different forms. So think of those terms. If you're a lawyer, either fighting for a particular forum or trying to stay out of a forum because you think the law is not in your favor in that area. Uh, there are many decisions that are extremely divergent in logic and outcome, uh, but rarely will there be an absence of discussion of uh, international shoe and Zippo. Defendants uh, participate in international uh, commerce 
must not only, uh, merely be a fortuitous event, but also have something to do with the presence in the case. And the reason I mention that, in a case called Worldwide Volkswagen, some folks bought a car in one state, and they were driving through Oklahoma when there was uh, a failure in the car and a lawsuit was filed in Oklahoma. And the court said, okay, yeah, you have a presence here because the cars in Oklahoma and your uh, the plaintiffs in Oklahoma at the time of the accident, but you're just driving through. That is too fortuitous to give presence to uh, national. Now, it was an interesting case to me. Um, it was in Texas. Uh, we have a Peruvian uh, country uh, company that uh, did business in uh Texas. They bought uh, helicopters at, in Houston. Uh, they trained a bunch of their pilots in Texas. They had a relationship with a, not, uh, with a limited partnership that was based out of Houston. One of the uh, pilots uh, flying outside of the United States killed some uh, uh, Texas citizens. And so a lawsuit was filed in Texas. And the uh, Texas court said that they had jurisdiction, but the United States Supreme Court said, no, you don't have jurisdiction. There wasn't enough presence for this Peruvian co co company to be uh, sued in, in Houston. Here's the problem. Where can they be sued then? You know, we have a, a negligent act. We have death, so we have damages. Well, where can you file a lawsuit if you can't file it there? So it, it, it brought up a real interesting problem for the, the plaintiffs on what they were going to do in their case. I personally think the United States Supreme Court made a serious mistake in this case, that, that there was enough presence. And certainly the alternative of there being no forum, really, literally, that could uh, accommodate the, the issues was not right. Uh, so I put that, put that out to you. It's a case that uh, uh, you can always quote me as saying it's not a good one, but at the same time it is the case, and it's something you have to address if you're going to be a plaintiff trying to file a lawsuit, or you want to use if you are a defendant trying to stay out of a particular court. Now, Graduate Management Admissions Council is the next case. It's a district court case in 2003, and I think that uh, the U.S. Supreme Court should have considered the defendant's general uh, national presence uh, in using the US, uh, U.S. economy, which this case talks about. In other words, what happens if you have a defendant who is using the United States uh, economy, making a profit, doing well, but doesn't have enough specific uh, jurisdiction in any one state to give that court jurisdiction? What do you do then? Uh, one answer is... Uh, uh, rule uh, proceed, Civil Procedure 4K2. Uh, it's a federal rule. And it says basically, look, if you don't have enough presence in any one forum in the United States, yet you are uh, conducting business here and making money here, uh, and a federal law uh, question is in involved, then the federal court has jurisdiction even though that particular state doesn't have uh, enough presence. Uh, this is a good law to be used, uh, uh, but it does seem to require that there be a federal law question. So let's just say you have a products liability case. Uh, well, that's state law. Although you could argue that since the, federal, the Supreme Court says we, the federal courts adopt state law decisions on these civil matters, you could argue that, well, that means that they, the federal courts have adopted state law and therefore it is federal law. Uh, I don't think you'll win that argument, but I'll be happy to testify for you. Uh, the other possibility is that many of the federal statutes, even though they may not have uh, remedies within the statute where you can collect money as a violation of the statute, there can be negligence per se. In other words, a violation of that statute gives rise to uh, evidence the court can use of negligence because you violated that statute. I have a case right now dealing with the Americans with Disabilities Act where they, the uh, Walmart violated the safety regulations required for people who are in wheelchairs. So I can submit to the court that they 
uh, uh, tell the jury that that violation uh, can be a act of negligence per se as a matter of law because they violated that statute. So I think you can get there that way too. So that would be the argument that you want to make if you're trying to stay in the United States if there's not specific jurisdiction in any one court. How am I doing on time? Anybody fall asleep out there yet? You look away. Okay. Okay. And it's like, if you don't mind, I think students prepare the questions for you. Well, I tell you what, that'd be wonderful. All right. Anything else that I would have said is on my webpage. Read it. Email me. I'll be happy to, to come, uh, or, or Skype me, whatever you want to do. And I'll be happy to talk to you about these issues. But why don't you guys take over and just let me ask, uh, answer questions. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Please, if you have questions, yes, you're welcome to ask. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. It was very interesting. It was very informative. Uh, but we have some problems uh, with sound, and so not all for un understandable for us. And I have one question. Uh, there are a lot of cases, uh, concerns with the damage to property. And my question is, uh, can the parties agree to transfer the resolving disputes such disputes uh, for resolving by arbitrage or it is, it is on the jurisdiction of state courts? Ah. That's a good question. The, 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 the vast movement in the United States is to have uh, re resolutions uh, by mediation or arbitration. Uh, any of the cases that I've talked about when you file it in federal court, uh, uh, you can, uh, and that court probably will even uh, invite you, uh, order you to do a, a mediation prior to being able to do, do all of the court system. Also, certainly in any contract, you can put in, here's the forum that I want to have this thing litigated, or I want it to be, our, uh, we all agree that if there's a problem, it must be arbitrated, and what country and we're going to do the arbitration. All of that is available to you. Especially before the fact. Thank you very much. Did I answer your question? Yes. Okay. You have answered. Okay. You have answered my question. Thank you very much. Sure. What's What's next?
Yeah. Uh, that's the our system is you know we were so so worried about individual rights and states' rights that we really got things divided up way too much. But uh, I think that having just one court might be a problem too. One of the nice things about Russia is that your court system and all of the modern law that you guys are working with started really what mid 1980s. So you're right at the threshold because you guys are very very smart people. I've been over many times. It's a great system that is pregnant for all sorts of new innovations and structures within the, uh, the uh, country and within the judicial system. And especially interesting, since we're in the middle of all of this technology now, that you'll be able to create systems that are better than you can find in other parts of the world. Oh, somebody's got to have another question. about what presence is uh, is something you need to research in advance if you can for instance let's say you would like to file your lawsuit in New York because the law is better in New York than it is in Russia or it is in some other states in the United States so you start investigating does this defendant have a presence under the definitions of the court either general presence or specific presence as to the issues of your lawsuit do they have a web page? If somebody in New York, for instance, uh, goes on to their web page and, and sends an email, I like your product, I think I'd like to buy some. What are the prices? What, what are the uh, characteristics of the product? And they give that to you and then you enter into a contract and you buy the product. That is a presence in New York through the internet to a New York citizen. So it's, each one of them are factually uh, intense, well activity means presence, either specifically or generally in that form. And if you have enough within the, and the court agrees with you, then you can use that form. If you, and of course, obviously, if you're filing a lawsuit, you would have researched in advance, I'd rather be here because the law is better for me here than somewhere else. So it's kind of activities. Yes. Well, you remember, you know, most of the time you're suing corporations. Corporations don't exist. They're a piece of paper. The only thing they have is activity. So uh, that's what you would go on. Uh, and then you have to worry about whether or not the court feels it is in, too inconvenient to try it in that state. Sometimes, even if there's enough presence, the court will say, and there's a motion you can file called form non-convenience. I'm not going to hear this case because all of the witnesses are in Italy. All of the uh, uh, all of the laws that what should apply are in Italy. I'm not going to hear it because it's not convenient to the parties. There's a case that uh, came out of uh, uh, one of the courts here. I'm trying to remember which one, where uh, there was a lawsuit filed on products liability in the United States about one American citizen, but all the other people who were injured were from Italy. So the court on a motion for my convenience moved, they said, yes, we have the right to hear it here, but all the witnesses and all of the things, the witness, the, the, where that accident happened, everything are in Italy, so I think it'd be better to try it there. But the court did another thing that's very interesting, and something you should ask for if you lose the form you want, and that they said, only if the defendants agree to the statute of limitations and, and uh, submit to the jurisdiction of the Italian court. If they don't, we'll take it here. And we're going to leave the case open until we find out whether or not they have a de decent form in, in Italy. So another thing you have to worry about in the cases is 
how much strings are, is the court going to put on moving the case to Italy or some other place to make sure that the, the issues, the equity is heard, the issues are heard and, and ruled on by somebody? Thank you. Thank you for the uh, It's a very interesting area of the law, and it's something you guys are going to be right in the middle of. You're the generation that's going to be making these decisions. People don't just do business in Russia. People don't just do business in England. They do business all over, and so one of the biggest issues you're going to have is where do I have the, where I have the biggest advantage for my clients? Or if somebody has filed it somewhere, how can I get out of that because the advantage is not to my client? A book that I recommend that all of you read, mainly because it's very short, and I love short books, is called The Art of War by Sun Tzu. He's a Asian uh, ph philosopher general. And one of the things he says in that book is always seek the high, dry ground. And he's talking about seeking the advantage before battle. And of course, a, a lawsuit is, is about it. I, I solved all the problems. That's great. all of you. I, I love going to Russia. I love the students there. I love the lawyers I met there. God bless all of you. Now, go to my website because I only went through about half my presentation and email me. I promise you I'll answer your questions if you have any. Later.